the Cold Crush Brothers. The Cold Crush Brothers consist of Grandmaster Kaz, Easy AD, JDL, Almighty KG, and DJs Charlie Chase and Tony Tone. There's actually two legacies within the legacy of the Cold Crush Brothers. The legacy of the brothers and the legacy of Grandmaster Kaz. The origins of the Cold Crush Brothers can be traced back to Grandmaster Kaz, who was an MC and DJ as early as 1975, with his partner Disco Wiz, one of the first Puerto Rican DJs. Later, Grandmaster Kaz formed the Mighty Force MCs with Whipper Whip, Dada Rock, and Mighty Mike. Later on, Whipper Whip and Dada Rock would go on to join the Fantastic Five MCs. Kaz also formed a group called the Force Five MCs and later the Notorious Two with JDL and Kaz himself. When Kaz met DJ Charlie Chase, Chase was one of the few Puerto Rican DJs playing black music as most were playing Spanish or disco. When he met him, he was putting together a group and wanted Kaz to be down. They held auditions and it came down to KG and JDL. Chase wanted the almighty KG but Kaz was already down with JDL and the Notorious too. Kaz said that either JDL had to be down or he couldn't be down. Grandmaster Kaz handpicked Easy AD for the group and Tony Tone came to the group from the Brothers Disco, Breakout and Barry. For the majority of the Cold Crush Brothers recording career, they recorded for Tough City Records. But the specialty of the Cold Crush Brothers was not recording. The specialty of the Cold Crush Brothers was live performance. Within these live performances were routines mostly made up by Grandmaster Kaz and mostly created from popular songs and tunes from pop culture. These harmonizing routines over top of breakbeats masterfully spun by DJ Charlie Chase was what gave the Cold Crush Brothers the edge. The live performance of the Cold Crush Brothers could not be touched in their heyday. The dynamic stage presence of the Cold Crush Brothers combined with the fact that Grandmaster Kaz kept special rhymes on deck for hecklers and would spit these darts at hecklers almost on demand made the Cold Crush Brothers an unstoppable force. It can't be overstated that DJ Charlie Chase was one of the most dependable DJs on the wheels of steel. When I say a dependable DJ, the record rarely skipped when Charlie Chase was on the wheels of steel. And if it did skip, Chase always found a way to bring it back in on beat. As far as catching the smallest of break beats, Chase is one of the most precise and always made his MCs look good and kept them on point. After Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five achieved worldwide success on the strength of their 1982 groundbreaking single, The Message, there was a hole left in the Bronx and every good MC or MC crew wanted to fill that hole. The two top contenders were the Fantastic Five and the Cold Crush Four. The members of these two Bronx groups were best of friends in the streets, but when it came to the battle for the title of the best MCs in the Bronx, they were mortal enemies. You can check out some of their classic battles and rivalries on Charlie Ahern's groundbreaking Wild Style film. Although the Cold Crush did not achieve commercial success with their studio recordings, their tapes are the things of legend. The tapes of their live recordings traveled all around New York. In fact, when Sylvia Robinson stepped into a New Jersey pizza parlor and Big Bank Hank was rapping along to a tape, it was a tape of the Cold Crush. As with any other group that had multiple members, the Cold Crush brothers had different personalities and different dynamics for every member. Grandmaster Kaz was the master lyricist. He would be the equivalent of what Kumo D was to the Treacherous Three or Melly Mel was to the Furious Five. He was a master of storytelling and multi-syllabic wordplay. In fact, if you go back to my lesson with Rakim, why Rakim is the God MC, I talk about a technique that Kumo D and Grandmaster Kaz pioneered early on. I spoke about rhyming multiple words with one word or rhyming multiple words with multiple words, which was a technique that Rakim took over the top, but it was definitely started by brothers like Kumo D and Grandmaster Kaz. I spoke of a rhyme where Kaz said, he returned to his environment to see where the fire went. And as I was preparing for this lesson, I went and listened to the It's Us routine, which I'll get to later. That's one of my favorite routines by the Cold Crush. And in that routine, he said he was the MC with the most pizzazz, ranked number one in his social class. Now again, early on, this was probably 81, 82, they were doing that routine, probably more like 82. 
another early example of uh, the style that Rakim will later master and really be known for. And there are tons of other examples of that kind of rhyme flow. And as far as the storytelling, you definitely want to go and check out uh, the event rhyme of Wild Style. It was a long time ago, but I never forget. I got caught in a bed with a gun and Well, I was scared like hell, but I got away. That's why I'm here telling you today. I was out at other schools, hooking up the rock with a crowd of people all around. Yeah. Listen to my spot, just me and my fan. And some guys from the crew chilling hard because we had nothing better to do. It was me, the L, the A, and the R. And then I slipped away to make a phone call this very day. It was a move I regret, but it didn't know then. So I called me back. Hey, hello, pretty mama. It's your lover man. She said, baby, come on over. You know, one of the things that makes a great MC is definitely having that comedic aspect to it as well. And Kaz always had that comedic aspect, especially within his storytelling. Like, you know, he said he ran, uh, what I think he said, 46 blocks and he stopped to breathe. You know, and he says it, you know, very nonchalantly. Like, you know, he's serious about it. And then he says that the girl said, uh, Kaz, somebody's coming. And he said, yeah, me. You know, all those very... Uh, very key key techniques to making a good rhyme. Not only a, a very good, vivid story that he told, but also uh, had the comedic aspects as well. And again, if you've seen any of my other uh, lessons, especially on the uh, MCs from that first era, you'll know that, you know, I always talk about how Kaz is part of that that trinity of MCs, that first what they call holy trinity of MCs with, um, with himself and Kumo D from The Treacherous Three and uh, Grandmaster Melly Mel from uh, The Furious Five. So definitely one of the one of the greats, you know, one of the greats that Big Daddy Kane and a slew of other, um, you know, later MCs that were greats, you know, the, the G raps and cats like that always cite Kaz as an influence. So you know, a very powerful force within the group. In fact, you know, when you got a group like that, um, and you got a you got a Mel or Kaz in the group, sometimes they get overshadowed the rest of the guys who are are good MCs within their own within their own rights but may not have the lyrical prowess that a cat like a Kaz has. So a lot of times they drown out their, their group members, you know, not intentionally, but they just, you know, so talented lyrically that a lot of times you don't get a chance to see the, the dynamic that the other uh, group members bring to the, uh, to the table. The almighty KG, definitely, uh, to me, he was like the, uh, it, 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 such a powerful voice. You know, if you've ever heard or seen them live, you know, he, he brings a certain power to uh to the group definitely in the audio you, you can hear it you know you got one of those those deeper uh those deeper voices and it, just a powerful attack of the microphone when you um when you see kg and when you hear kg and later on in probably uh, i guess 88 or so um they did a solo thing with just tony tone who called himself tony crush at the time him and uh and kg call themselves the Cold Crush Brothers and they had a single out on uh, B-Boy Records which was the same label that uh, KRS-One and JVC Force and a couple other groups recorded for but the song was called Field of Horns and that's another example you can just hear hear the power within KG's voice Easy AD would be like the flosser in the group you know I always did hate the word uh, swag and you know it's finally kind of died down but if you were to, you know, say swag or swagger back in those days, that's what uh, that's what Easy AD had, you know. Um, and cats like him, he's the equivalent to like Scorpio in the Furious Five, or even Waterbed Kev in the Fantastic Five. These are cats who can rhyme, but a lot of times they're unfairly criticized for not being as lyrical um, or being like a, a weak link in the group, which is not true. Uh, you, you got, I think it was. Um, it, it might have been Mo D. I think it was Mo D who told me, you know, you can't have, you know, four or five rock hymns on stage. Everybody can't be, you know, the super lyricist in the group. Everybody has their own dynamic that they bring to it. And uh, Scorpio always says that's his chamber, is, is, the, is, the, is the visual aspect of it, you know. And that's easy AD. You know, they, they dress a certain way. They're usually the one in the group that's uh, slated to be like the girl taker. In fact, a easy AD calls himself Supreme Easy AD. But he also calls himself, one of his monikers is the Girl Taker AD. And they're like, you know, the heartthrob of the group, or they position themselves as the heartthrob of the group. Usually the, um, the more well-dressed or the most eccentric as far as being dressed. You know, uh, you always hear Scorpio brag about his braids. And you even heard uh, Easy AD brag about his braids in different routines and on uh, Fresh Wild Fly Bow. You know, he could, 
hear him say you even wanted your braids as long as mine you know so they, that's the fly guy in the group and you got to have that in, you know in a group that size with four or five mcs you need those different dynamics jdl my man jdl the hut maker um jdl is the energy the energy in the group and i said kg was the power but JDL is the energy, especially live. You know, he's just, he, he's a force to be to be reckoned with live, you know, and a good rhyme writer as well. But uh, definitely a key to making the routines. You know, you can hear his ad-libs on the routines and you can hear, you know, just, just his style just comes through so much in the group. But again, it's that energy, especially on the live tip. Uh, JDL, I've probably had more conversations with JDL than I've had with anybody in the group. You know, I... Spent a lot of time interviewing and just talking to JDL, especially in the early days of him getting his book together. I helped him a little bit with that. And um, he's a walking encyclopedia as far as break beats and just, you know, even the, the, the dressing and everything. You know, you know, cats, it's a kind of a cliche these days to say, I am hip hop. You know, everybody wants to say that. And, you know, you have shirts to say, I am hip hop. But a cat like JDL, he's definitely hip hop, not just because he's a part of the Cold Crush Brothers and he's an MC. And he can tell you everything, you know, about the break beats and the drum machines. And, you know, he's a walking encyclopedia on the tennis shoe culture of the 70s and 80s. He's just, you know, all around, you know, he's hip hop, certainly. And the break beat that, that you know, he kind of made his own was the assembly line by the Commodores. It's, in fact, kind of a weird story how, he, you know, his moniker is the hut maker. And I asked him, well, what, what the hell is a hut maker? What, how are you the hut maker? And it goes back to a routine. Like I said, it's kind of weird. On assembly line, the breakdown, they're going hut, hut, um, and then you know I think they go hut two, three, four. On, on the assembly line, the Commodore song, they're actually talking about you know from the moment you're born, you kind of part of a assembly line. So they're, they're you know they're kind of marching on the breakdown, and that's a popular breakbeat. Everybody used it from Teddy Riley to the Cold Crush to you know damn near every rap record in that so-called golden age of the late '80s. The weird part is that they're saying hut, hut. And he had a routine where, you know, it sounds like they're saying her, depending on how you do it. In fact, Teddy Riley uh, and Guy on the album The Future, their, their second album, there's a song called Her. And for the background of it, they're using the assembly line break. And that's an idea I'm pretty sure that they got from, from the Cold Crush, and specifically JDL, because he would, on the routine, they would have assembly line, that breakdown of assembly line going, it's going hut, hut. And he's saying, he's pointing to different girls in the crowd, and he's saying, you know, her, her. It sounds like the break is saying her, but it's saying hut. And then, you know, he says her and her sister, you know, he wants her, her. And that's, you know, that's something that Teddy, you could definitely tell he pulled it from, uh, from the cold crush. But that's why he calls himself the hut maker. So that, that's kind of a weird moniker to take from that break but that's what he did and he made it work so uh so that's jdl and as i mentioned earlier uh charlie chase is just again um preciseness you know being on beat is a very important thing I, that's something i know as an mc um having somebody behind you that's dependable you know you can do all the tricks in the world you can cut fast and do all of those things but when you're a part of a group and you're a dj you're everything you're essentially like what the drummer is to the band you know you you set the tempo for everything and if you fall off beat, then the whole thing falls apart. And um, Chase was very good at keeping a steady beat. He, he, excellent with cutting and scratching also. But again, records weren't really the thing that this group excelled at. It was the live performance. And if you listen to the live performances again, his favorite break beats to spin were like uh, Love Rap by Spoonie G. And a lot of their routines were done off uh, uh, Rocket in the Pocket, things like that. And he was always very precise with those beats and seldom made mistakes. <clears throat> but when he did make a mistake, um, you know, the MCs had the skill to come right back on beat or not fall off beat at all, which is a hallmark of a good MC from that era. And, uh, you know, Chase knew how to how to cover that that mishap up. Tony Tone, Tony Tone, he's you know, he's a good, he's, he's a good guy. When I say he's a good guy, I mean from the standpoint of never tries to take attention uh, for anything. You know, he was actually came up with the name for the group. You know, he says it came to him almost like in a dream. He just woke up one day and said it's Cold Crush. And originally he said it was the Cold Crush Crew. 
and he he told Chase, you know, I want to cause the Cold Crest crew, and Chase recommended Brothers instead of Crew, and they went with that. But uh, Tone was down before Chase, long before Chase in the group, and had been around and had more experience on the wheels. But he said that he'd rather play backup DJ to Chase because Chase was so good as a Puerto Rican DJ and there weren't many Puerto Rican DJs out there at the time. Now, Kaz was down with Disco Wiz, as I mentioned earlier, and DJ Swat, both Puerto Rican DJs. But according to Tone, they weren't as good and didn't take it as seriously as Chase did. So Tone's thinking was, look, at our shows and parties, if we put Chase out front, as good as he is as a Puerto Rican DJ, we can corner the black market and the Puerto Rican market because we got a lot of Puerto Ricans in the party already. And when they see somebody representing for them, they're going to continue to come to the parties and bring more people. So that was the strategy where, you know, Tone could have easily been the, the, the actual lead DJ. But again, he took a back seat to, uh, to let Chase shine because he felt like you know, Chase had something special. In addition to being Puerto Rican, he's a good DJ regardless but you know that was the icing on the cake being a Puerto Rican DJ and of course Tone is the one who like the master of building these huge sound systems and that's something that he still does to this day you know he's a company doing it and you know he still does parties and events you know just building these huge sound systems and that's something that he did way back in his days with uh, with the Brothers Disco with Breakout and Baron I refer to Tone as, as the quiet enforcer. You know, Tone, if you really have a good conversation, interview with him, you know, he don't take no shit. But, you know, you would never know that he's like a gentle giant almost. You know, so uh, definitely when you got those kind of characteristics from, from, you know, five or six different people, you know, you got a strong unit, and, and that's the Cold Crush. As far as the routines of uh, the, the Cold Crush brothers are presented in their stage show, that's what they're known for. Just you know, the stage show and, and the routines that that made up the stage show. That that's the legacy of the Cold Crush, and those were mostly created by Grandmaster Kaz. Um, I know that JDL. I saw an interview with JDL and Troy L. Smith, and JDL told Troy that he they had probably seventy some routines, uh, over seventy routines that they had made up over the course of their career to different songs and, and different rhythms and beats and you know most of their routines contain harmonizing um, even though they didn't use all 70 in fact most of those 70 we've never heard but that's how many they had a total and they were based it was harmonizing based off of already popular uh, songs and usually uh, like soft rock type stuff you know Kaz you know listening a lot of, I think it was WABC the station in New York uh, where he listened to growing up I've heard a lot of a lot of the uh, cats New York cats MCs they listened to that station growing up I, I've heard Kid Creole from the Furious Five talk, him, and, him and Mel grew up listening to that station so that's one of the, the reasons they have such a vast musical knowledge because they didn't just listen to black music or urban music but I, I've been with Kaz, and he has on his person, on his iPod or whatever he plays his music on, his iPod at the time, he had nothing but classic rock songs, still to this day. And he would build those routines based on the, the melodies and the rhythms of these classic rock songs. Like they got a routine uh, to Copacabana. They got a routine to uh, Rhinestone Cowboy by Neil Diamond. Like I said, a Barry Manilow, you know, that was Coco Cabana. Um, they got one to Cat Stevens, uh, Cats in the Cradle. Just, you know, m most of their routines were, were based off of uh, the melodies to these songs. And then when you put something like Rocket in the Pocket behind it or uh, Love Rap, which I always talk about being a very special record, rest in peace to Pumpkin, the drummer on Love Rap, which was Spoonie G's. I think it was the A side to uh, to the single he had with New Rap Language with the Treacherous 3 on the B side. An important rap record because, again, it became a breakbeat in itself. You know, most breakbeats weren't rap records back in the days. A, a few rap records became breakbeats. You know, records like uh, uh, Catch the Beat by uh, T-Ski Valley, you know, that became a breakbeat. A few of the Treacherous 3 records did. Uh, heartbeat. Uh, and probably because of, not probably, definitely because of Pumpkin's drumming 
these rap records became breakbeats themselves. And, you know, every DJ had two copies of the love rap, which, you know, you, you know that record went at least gold because, you know, especially, you know, in, in the boroughs, every, every DJ had two copies because it was a breakbeat. And most of their routines or a good number of their routines were done to either rock it in the pocket, love rap, or to break down to, uh, to heartbeat. You can hear Chase cutting that up and, and, and very well on a lot of the routines. Again, my favorite routine was It's Us. It's just, you know, the rhymes they were saying, uh, just the finesse of it, the way they put it together. The, you know, I've probably heard 10 different versions of it, and they're infinitely more out there because you got to remember, every time they did a show or a party, there's not a tape that exists for every show or party. You know, a, a cat like my man Troy Smith is trying to get every one of them that was recorded but all of them weren't recorded and each one that was recorded you know we don't necessarily have possession of so uh there are many different versions of uh of this us and you might hear a version where even when they fell off beat it was just sometimes it's fly how they fall off beat even though it's a mistake so you might have one version where a cat falls off beat a certain way or the record almost skips a certain way. And it just is the, that dynamic that makes it a very good recording. Uh, something very organic that happens. But I think the best version of It's Us that I've heard, in fact, I know it was on a Tony Touch mixtape. And I don't remember which one it was, but I, I don't have it anymore. I wish I did because that's, that's my favorite version of It's Us. But It's Us is definitely one of their most revered routines. Another favorite of mine was the one done to the tune of Rhinestone Cowboy by Neil Diamond. And that one was called You Don't Know How Boy. Another favorite of mine, and I'm not sure the official name of the routine, but I call it 82 because they're continuously saying 82 as for 1982 in the routine. And it's done, I believe, to the rhythm of uh, Georgie Porgy by Toto. Yeah, the Cold Crush has so many routines, like they just seem to be infinite. But here's another. Oh, and that's the 
Now, as far as the Cold Crush recordings, um, once again, recordings weren't their thing. I, to me, the best record they made, and I think most Cold Crush fans would agree, was Fresh Wild Flying Bone. That was that was the record that we wished all their records had been in that vein. You know, I don't know if the planets came together correctly. I don't know if, um, you know, the production was just right on it. You know, I, I remember talking to uh, JDL. And he told me every element of that record. And it was a very interesting story. He's told me more than once, but I never got a chance to record him. And um, I never got a chance to follow up with him. But the way that that beat came together was very interesting. And every little piece in there, uh, he knew where it came from. And it was, it was a really good story that I have to revisit one day if possible. But the first record that the Cold Crush made was on Elite Records. And I believe that was um, Arthur Armstrong's label. And it was called The Weekend, And, um, you know, according to JDL, he wanted them to do some some concept record that was really crazy that they didn't agree to. So um, Cass said the best thing he had, you know, close to a concept that would have still been dope was a routine they had about The Weekend. And The Weekend, you know, it suffered the same um, issues that a lot of the early rap records had. You know, back then you still had bands, um, actually playing the music, you know, you you couldn't legally uh, make a, a a record the way that Cats was doing their routines in the park, you know, off of break beats. The technology didn't allow it yet, and um, just the copyright laws and everything else just wasn't possible yet. You know, we were four or five years away from that. So in '82, they had a band come in and play a beat, and one of the redeeming things about it, it did have a breakdown. In fact, it comes in the intro of it is a is a breakdown like a break beat and the cold crush actually used it as a as a break beat and they used it uh they used the weekend a lot of times as the intro to their show and chase would be backing up the uh the beginning of the weekend it's like a little horn part sounds like and then the beat comes in but it's a it's actually a really good record technically from a rhyme standpoint they're talking about you know Kind of in the vein of the OJs when they say living for the weekend. They talk about how you're looking forward to the weekend. And then they go through every day of the week and talk about, okay, you know, this happened on Monday. And this happened on on Tuesday. And, you know, now the weekend's finally here. So it was a, it was a very good record from that standpoint. Everybody, listen to this. The weekend's coming, so don't you dare miss. You're going to regret it if you're not on the scene. And then you get so mad, it'll make you scream. Everyone, give us your attention, please. Especially those of you who like parties. It's a message. Now, one one thing that every member of the group <laughs> that I've talked to, I've, I've talked to most most members at some point. Um, one thing they agree on is that Tough City just wasn't the label to get them to where they could have been. And I, I agree with them. I think they have been on a stronger label with better promotion. They would have been a lot further. Um, JDL has echoed many times that the budget, first of all, it wasn't much of a budget. Um, it was Tough City, and then they had a distribution deal at one point through uh, CBS Associated Labels. And he just said the money wasn't there. I've talked to Aaron Fuchs, who was the CEO of the label, and he said during the time of, you know, from, I guess, 82, 83 on, CBS was paying so much attention to Michael Jackson because of Thriller, and they were shipping so much on Michael Jackson that the budget for everything went to Michael Jackson. But, you know, in any case, uh, the members of the group say that, you know, the attention was put on Spoonie G and Davy DMX for the whole time that the Cold Crush was doing records on uh, on Tough City, that it seemed like there was more attention and more budget and promotion put into Davy DMX and Spoonie G, which is interesting because they wasn't much budget and promotion put into Davy DMX and Spoonie G. So I can definitely imagine if all of it was going to Davy DMX and Spoonie G, everybody else was just getting their record pressed up and put in the stores. And the only way you knew it was there was. If you went in the store and you bought it, because definitely they, they weren't big on promotion. I think that Davy DMX's One for the Trouble could have been a lot bigger than it was, um, even though it was a huge record. And I think that Spoonie G's stuff um, back in the you know in 87, 88, you know, Godfather and that whole album, 
that stuff could have been a lot bigger. Even Street Girl, the stuff, Big Beat. You know, even though CBS was associated with that, it could have been a lot bigger. Anyway, this ain't a thing on Tough City, but it is uh, very interesting that um, they all they all kind of agreed that Tough City was kind of what held them back as far as being a much bigger group that made a bigger impact. Of course, they made their impact either way. I mean, you always hear DMC and sometimes run, but mostly DMC talk about when they did Raising Hell, they just, you know, they garnered this energy, the energy that, you know, they grew up on, you know, listening to groups like the Cold Crush. And DMC always says, you know, we took everything good about the Cold Crush and, you know, all, all the things, you know, that came before us and, you know, we put it into this record. And, um, you know, all of the greats, you know, your favorite MCs, favorite MC, that's, that's, that's Cold Crush. But uh, in 83, they made... Uh, they did punk rock rap. I remember li- reading about punk rock rap and like right on magazine or something like that. Right on magazine, it did a special edition back in probably uh, 80, 82, 83. And they were talking about like the top 10 rap records at the time. And um, punk rock rap was one of them. And when I finally heard it, I-, I never liked punk rock rap. I was a little disappointed. You know, it was experimental. And I understand why they made the record. The record was, uh, you know, Cold Crush was doing a lot of stuff like you know, um, at the grill and places like that, you know, so they had a, um, they had the downtown audience with the, uh, you know, um, the punk rockers and all of that. So I understand, you know, I understand why they did the record, but it was, you know, never my, my, my thing. But I think what came out of that record more so than anything as a piece of pop culture trivia was the, Oh my God, that, uh, Dougie Fresh had his DJs cut up for, uh, for the show. You know, that intro came from uh, punk rock rap. It was a novelty record to me. It was never never my thing, especially by that time, you know, Run and D were making it, just making Suck MCs and all those records. And he was just starting to strip the beats down and, you know, all the profile stuff. So, you know, to come with a, a punk rock record, that, rock record that felt like a novelty just wasn't something that I was a big fan of. Oh, my God! It's the Cold Crush! But the next year they got it right. They got it right in '84 with Fresh Wild Flying Bold. That's 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 their record. That's the like again. That's the record everybody wished that they could have made that kind of record during their whole career. The planets lined up right for them. They had a some kind of distribution deal with Profile. So you know some people have a, a copy on Tough City. Some people have a copy on Profile. There are two different versions or vocal takes that you can you, you can tell. There's one they called a remix. That it was a different take. Um, vocal take. I prefer the one that was on the profile uh, single that had the uh, vocoder version of It's Us on it, and you know, with the scratch mix and all of that. That's the vocal take that I, I prefer. They had another take that sounded almost like they were um, like it was one of their reference takes or like one of their first takes that shouldn't have been a, a final a final product. Some of the some of the phrasing was different. The cadence was a little different, so on, different on some stuff. And some of the ad libs and stuff. So I prefer the profile. Um, standard version that came out but that was that was the record that record you know each person took on a, a persona of, of a different adjective you know fresh wild fly bow you know and and um from the standpoint the cold course never made straightforward records and that might have been the problem they never you know kind of overdoing it. instead of just coming on and just spitting rhymes it, it was always a concept um and sometimes the concept you know weekend was a concept punk rock rap was definitely a concept um, it worked with Fresh Wild Fly and Bold, but it's even Heartbreakers, which I'll get to in a minute, they all had a concept and something behind it, which you know might have been more than what the audience wanted. You know, just uh, throw the throw a drum machine on and rhyme. But um, they did it on Fresh Wild Fly Bold. It worked. Guess what, y'all? I'm fresh. What makes you say so, cap? Because I look so good and I'm the lord of rap. How fresh? So fresh that when I was young, I learned to drive women crazy with my tongue. That ass fresh. When I start to break hate, you better step back and let me play. Now that's wild, wild, wild. <laughs> well, I'm fly. Who told you that, Easy? Your girl, his mother, and my late teeth. How fly? So fly, sometimes it seems all I got to do is smile and I get screamed. Now that's fly, fly, fly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bold. What gives you that impression, K? Because I don't care what nobody says. And know 
So the next year in 85 was Heartbreakers. And Heartbreakers, again, the concept, you know, I think I heard I heard one of them say that, you know, they was, you know, messing around with different girls and, you know, one one might start messing with one member of the group and mess with somebody else, you know, whatever it was. So they had gotten their hearts broken. So they flipped it. And they became the Heartbreakers on the song. And um, it was a good enough song. You know, it had a, a good beat to it. But I prefer, um, it was a version they had called a Heartbreakers Party. It was almost like they were just rhyming. Um, what you would call a freestyle back then, which back then a freestyle didn't mean off the top of your head. You know, you used just rhyming with no subject, just kind of just free form. Just, you just kept going. No, no definite hook or anything, no definite subject matter, just spitting rhymes. And I think um, I preferred, I know I preferred that version over the standard version. And rap rookies and sucker and MCs Bow down to the Lord, drop to your knees Cause chill time is over, Mr. Nice Guy's gone And everybody's getting put in check from now on From the top to the bottom, I'm checking my file Everybody get a lawyer, you're all on trial And if you're found guilty, you have to answer to me Cause I'm the judge, prosecutor, and the jury Is made up of those who've proven themselves able We all sit down at the rap round table Reside over the masses, enforce the laws If we decide to call you out, you better go for yours yeah. Grandmaster Cass had quite a few uh, solo endeavors on uh, or Tough City. Mr. Bill, um, he did a he made Yvette into a song. You know, he took the long rhyme he did from Wild Style soundtrack, which came out in like '82 or whatever, and he made that into an entire song. Um, oh man, he, he had quite a few, quite a few. Some of them produced by the, uh, the late great Pumpkin. Um, a couple produced maybe by yeah by Marley Marl and. You know, he had like some unreleased stuff that came out a few years ago. Like a whole, he had a full LP on Tough City. Um, quite a few releases. Crescent Ave, which is a good song. He, he had quite a few uh, records. You know, some some better than others. He, he never really had. To me, uh, and this is not all Tough City's fault, but to me, he never had a record that lived up to what his capabilities were. You know, he's a great MC, but he never had that great solo record where it's like oh you know this is, this is dope you know it's just always uh, like I said bogged down a lot of times by too many ideas sometimes mediocre production and then you know Tough City you know to top it off as, as the label uh, just didn't didn't produce the kind of records that he he should have been able to produce um, and then of course the Cold Crush you know they killed it on the Wild Style soundtrack quite, quite a few bright moments on that soundtrack now I spoke earlier of uh, in 88 on b-boy records uh almighty kg teamed up with tony tone under the name tony crush and they called themselves the cold crush brothers just those two those two members and they put out uh they put out a whole album called troopers but the single that really hit hard was feel the horns and again uh you can you can really get the power of, of kg's voice and delivery through that song if rock in the house well is a crime then let me be guilty. Feel the horn. 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 You can call me KG or call me the survivor. Others don't agree, so they label me a liar. But you and you know my rhymes is hot like saliva. I'm potent like acid, a Coca-Cola classic. And when I had your girl, she said I was fantastic. Like Libby on the label, I'm labeling you're a duck. I'm coming out strong while you're mentally stuck. Imitators can't make a buck. Feel the horn. Feel the horn. Feel the horn. Feel the horn. Yeah, so the Cold Crush, they've done uh, you know, quite a few things over the years. Definitely many things since 88, and I can't name them all. But, you know, Kaz is always on television on some kind of documentary. You know, he, he teamed up with... Uh, Wonder Mike and Master G and he's you know done some shows with them because I, I didn't get into the story about Big Bank Hank and the verses with Kaz and all of that. If you, if you look at my Sugar Hill gang 
lesson, which even if you don't like the Sugar Hill Gang, is a very uh, informative lesson, and I tell that story there. You go to the foundation.com, T-H-A foundation.com. Uh, there's a whole story that Troy Smith did with uh, with Kaz about Rapper's Delight and, you know, Hank taking the lyrics and uh, Kaz not getting compensated and all of that. So, you know, you know that story. But in, in the years uh, since Hank's passing in more recent years, and rest in peace to Big Bang Hank, um, Kaz has filled in on a couple of occasions and did the actual lyrics that he wrote for Rapper's Delight. He's performed them. And it, it always sounds good, you know, when you hear Kaz saying, you know, himself, I'm the C-A-S in the O-V-A, because that's Kaz, Kaz and Overfly, you know, was a long version of his name. So you've seen Kaz, you know, all over doing stuff, you know, he does the Hush Tours in New York, um, which is a tour bus that goes to the old school, uh, you know, places in New York, the uh, historic sites where, where all the history happened. And the Cold Crush Brothers did something on a Terminator X album back in the 90s. Um, along with Fantastic Five, and they they put out some records. Uh, I believe that uh, KRS One had a label at one point, and and they put a couple things out. And Kaz has done some solo stuff, and um, they've collaborated and done some things. And um, definitely, you've seen their you've seen their name out there for the last twenty years or so. Uh, definitely, the last ten years or so, uh, doing doing various things. Kaz more so than the whole crew, but you've seen the crew too, and they still you know, perform and do shows. Um, Money Ray, who was a brother that was down with them from the beginning, he passed away not long ago, a few years ago. Um, rest in peace to him. He was part of uh, Tall, Dark, and Handsome on B-Boy Records, but he's originally uh, down with the Cold Crush. So uh, definitely Cold Crush is, stays busy these days, more so than they, they have, you know, probably throughout, uh, you know, even the beginnings of their career. They're finally getting some light shine on their name, but not enough, not as much as they should. But I, I, I can't repeat enough, the legacy of the Cold Crush, again, when I think hip-hop, you know, if I have to think of a group that really embodies that, nothing to do with records or finances or going gold or platinum, when I think of hip-hop, specifically the musical part of it, you know, um, two turntables and a mic, to use a cliche, two turntables and a mic scratching, you know, break beats and, and emceeing, um, the Cold Crush is one of the first groups that comes to mind, you know. Can't name a lot of records that were hits or any of those things like a lot of groups that came after them. But as far as hip hop and, and the musical part of it and, 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 and being true to that and being authentic to that, it, it's nobody out there um, that I can think of before I think of, uh, yeah, the CC4, the Cold Crush 4 um, with Chase and Tone, definitely. Is it them? No! Is it them? No! Well, who is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Who is it? Is it? And it's us. You know it's us, the Cold Crush. You know it's us, the Cold Crush. We are my, we double dust, suck with you, my. Uh, you know it's us, it's our taste. Woo! Oh, the ball keep crazy, girl. You know it's us, it's gonna go. Please, gonna take a blind girl home, oh, girl. You know it's us, it's easy. Yeah. 